Dr. Grossman has his degree in geophysics from the University of Hawaii. He uh, is stationed at Western, but actually serves on the uh, U.S. Geological uh, Survey Coastal and Marine Science uh, Center in Santa Cruz, California. And they are doing a lot of work on things up and down the coast that certainly can be impacted by climate change, including th such things as recovering and, and retaining species, uh, dealing with habitat change, and many other things. So uh, Dr. Grossman has some really interesting uh, examples, I think, of things that, we're, that are happening to us right now. And I'm hoping we'll be able to leave, that we will all be able to leave the room today with a sense of things that, yes, we must do, but also things that we can do. I think that optimism is important for us as we move ahead. So I'm delighted that Dr. Grossman is with us today, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce him and ask him to begin his presentation. Well, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here and share some of the science that we develop at the U.S. Geological Survey and Western Washington University and really a, a wide range of partners that we work with. Um, and it's, it's really gratifying to see so many people coming together like this in this venue monthly to inform yourselves. And that's part of what attracted me to come to the Northwest and really pursue most of my career here instead of other places where I kind of feel like there's not as much hope. Um, so there's a public will here that's growing and it's, it's really quite exciting to see. And I'd like to start with this video a couple years ago, a few years ago now. Um, this is becoming just more and more common around our country. A lot of fo folks are describing it as nuance, flooding. Um, for some people it's much uh, greater impact than just nuisance flooding. Um, and what one thing that we're learning about is the way we have been trying to protect ourselves with those types of seawalls, levees, what have you, is definitely protecting some of the property, but at the expense of beaches, uh, a lot of habitat and ecosystem services offshore, uh, to the point where we may want to consider some of those other impacts. So I want to acknowledge uh, a number of just fantastic partners over the years, a great team of folks working with me, and then move on to say, hey, we're starting to see a lot of this up in the river valleys too. Uh, large flood events that seemingly are coming more frequently. Uh, and um, we're gonna explore a few sort of key messages with this. What is this coastal squeeze that I'm, uh, f term I'm using? Look at the historical land use and the current landscape that we are now sort of uh, living on and that these coastal squeeze processes are operating on, some of the models and tools that we're developing to assess coastal change and impacts, and then how can we use this information and, and who is using this information? And then we'll end by going over some, some new ideas that are being developed for planning and adaptation uh, sort of strategies. But some key messages I want you to come out of this with. Is it the magnitude and the frequency of large stream flooding and coastal flooding events and these storm and wave impacts that we've been seeing recently? These are all projected to increase. The Pacific Northwest is very different than the rest of the country. Um, it's steep, it's young geology, uh, it's very intense um, climate and hydrology. And we, we undergo a lot more, more change. But we get a lot of management strategies and guidance from other estuaries like Chesapeake Bay and the East Coast. And I think we're learning now that there's some unique components of our system that we may want to factor into any kind of adaptation policy. Uh, planning is often uh, based on very stationary ideas that we've seen this kind of stability or change over the last 50 years, let's plan for that. But it's, our environment is constantly undergoing change and in some cases, like I'm gonna show you, in very complex, hard to predict ways. The land area that we all make 
uh, you know, for our homes and we gather food, uh, have our industries. It's very limited, to be honest, uh, in terms of how much more we can accommodate. Um, and it's being squeezed along with habitats in the area by climate effects from above and sea level rise from below and what we do in terms of land use uh, itself. <clears throat> and then finally, um, our ability to imp implement strategies that are resilient and invest our money wisely is fairly limited by a lack of understanding and especially a lack of appreciation for sort of what people are calling ecosystem services that really help people and our economy and our well-being. So quickly about me, who I am. I'm what they call a research scientist for the USGS. We're the only non-regulatory federal science agency in the country to support objective uh, information gathering and decision making. <clears throat> I'm a geologist, ge geophysicist by training, and as you'll see, it overlaps very uh, intimately with oceanography. Uh, I used to do a lot of that, scuba diving underwater, so I've spent a lot of time in the water and on the sea floor, including our river channel floors, scuba diving down the Skagit River, for example, because I want to know what's, what's there. Um, and I lead two projects. One is called this Coastal Storm Modeling System, Cosmos, and I'm going to be talking mostly about that today. But I also lead what's called a Coastal Habitats in Puget Sound project. It's meant to help inform decision making, especially for um, ecosystem restoration questions. And I only want to bring this up to let you know that we've redefined what we're going to be doing the next five years to address a national problem, which is runoff coming off of watersheds with a lot of contaminants, uh, sediments, nutrients, what have you. And we want to use the watershed here in the Nooksack and the Bellingham Bay area as a case study to demonstrate how well we can model and measure and understand how contaminants and sediments move through the system uh, off, off the watershed, uh, how much legacy contaminants out in the near shore environment are also being resuspended and then incorporated into uh, the biology around us, fish, shellfish, crab, and we know that's making its way all the way up through the food web to orca. <clears throat> and then finally, the other task I, uh, I run is serving as a tribal liaison at the USGS for natural hazard issues for all tribes uh, and Alaska First Natives uh, when it comes to uh, hazards across the country. So here's this coastal squeeze. What is this? We try to depict this in a diagram a few years ago uh, from the Skagit Climate Science Consortium, and I invite you to go visit that site. Uh, but what it's meant to show is this hourglass sort of shape um, with a lot of watershed runoff impacts coming from above. You heard a lot about this at the last uh, monthly seminar. Uh, as well as sea level rise coming up from below, getting higher and higher into that uh, hourglass. And you can imagine sea level rise will be starting to slow down the river, backwater the river, causing the river to flood more and impact that central area where we call home. But we also have two other really key processes operating on the landscape that's squeezing us. Part of it is the way we develop the landscape for urbanization and all kinds of industry. And this is a projection on the right from Marina Alberti's work at the UW. And if you just stare at the colors getting darker and darker around our coastal landscape, you know, that's indicative of what the growth projections are for um, the urban corridor. Where we place all this development then limits how rivers and shorelines can migrate through the, the landscape and you know, function the way they have always functioned. The fourth is the big elephant in the room that hardly anyone talks about, and that is groundwater is just below our surface and it sits on top of seawater that's in our coastal aquifers. And as sea level rise comes up, groundwater is also coming up. And it's gonna be, and it's already showing in some places, ponding above the land surface when there's king tides, 
with sea level rise projections I'll show you. Um, and then sometimes when the river's running high and it coincides with periods of storminess, we see evidence of the groundwater percolating up and in some places like Laconer, it's only 18 inches below the surface almost year round. Those are sump pumps on all the time. That's a lot of expense. It also slows down, you know, prolongs the drainage when you have a lot of uh, groundwater near the surface. So, section one, the current landscape and how historical land use is sort of painting the template for the rest of the talk. So we have a landscape like this. This is an example from the Skagit River Delta, uh, showing Mount Vernon up there in, in the top. Um, and what I want you to draw your attention to are the red lines. These are levees and dikes that we've used for flood control for about 100 years. And they do a great job at you know, protecting all the investments in, in agriculture. And we have an enormously important food production here with you know, most of the vegetable seed for really important vegetables being grown here and then feeding the rest of the country and in, in cases the world with cabbage and other things. This was also hugely important salmon habitat and we've lost about 90% of the salmon habitat when the river used to flow over that landscape. So what I wanna, what I wanna impart is that obviously we have these trade-offs and we've chosen to use levees and dikes to protect our infrastructure as you know. Now the ramifications of this are shown in these colors. Uh, there's been about, um, well, let me start with the big arrow at the bottom, the 90%. That's showing that about 90% of all the sediment coming down the Skagit River, in fact, goes offshore, away from the shoreline, out into deep water. And it's extended the landscape about a half a kilometer in the last 100 years. But about 10%, in fact, gets stored in the river channel, even though there's levees and dikes there. It's, it's just so much sediment coming in, it fills it up, and it's been filling up about uh, upwards of five to ten feet along the whole corridor. Now what happens also that our impacts, and it's sorry it doesn't come out very well, but the landscape across the Skagit Flats and many places like the Snohomish, uh, Stillaguamish, even here, has in fact subsided about a meter to a meter and a half inside the levees and dikes relative to just offshore and outside of the dikes because the sediment can't get there anymore. Um, We've disconnected the river from the floodplain, which is the point of the levees. The other thing, though, it's done is that box A, it's left marshes that were also hugely important for salmon, stranded offshore, sometimes 300, 500 meters, and eroding like the picture shows. Um, now what's happened, too, is that 70 to 100 years of focusing all that sediment out off the North Fork of the Skagit River, in this case, you could imagine piled up out there and now the river doesn't like to go there it wants to go somewhere a little bit easier and so just recently a few years ago it broke through over at that letter b and started moving 70 percent of the whole river flow and sediment down through that arrow towards the last remaining eelgrass beds of skagit bay and that's what this looks like this is a picture of that area zoomed in and all those colors show how much sediment has piled up in just six years uh, upwards of a meter or more across a really large area. This is 25 to 30 square kilometers. And it's so much sediment now that you can see the red colors coming out of that little um, channel are actually eroding through sediment that it just deposited there a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, it has made it all the way out to those green mapped colors offshore, which are the sort of rainforest of the temperate zone, the eelgrass beds. And it's burying now a lot of the remaining functioning eelgrass offshore. Now, there may be trade-offs and um, recovery of eelgrass elsewhere, but the question is how long does it take um, for these to sort of come back versus maybe the older ones to um, come back. And this is just a quick map showing our Nooksack system, the lower Nooksack. It also shows the same types of recent sedimentation the last six to 10 years. Um, not quite as much. It's a steeper gradient. Uh, it's going to be advantageous for all of this that we talk about. But there still is a lot of sediment being stored and then changes down in the delta that are uh, associated with 
clogging it up and changing the uh, ability for water to run off the landscape. And in the fact, uh, the Nooksack Delta has extended out a kilometer and a half over this same 100-year time frame, time frame. It's tremendous, and we can show you those details later. So then, that's the template that we're talking about all these future changes uh, coming to. And so quickly, um, you've heard a little bit about this um, in the last speakers, but um, this is downscaled information now, the projections for the Nooksack and the Skagit watersheds. The freeze line generally in the North Cascades has been rising since the 1950s um, and about 13 feet a year. And you can imagine as the snow and the freeze line moves up, all of that sediment that you see in the foreground in the form of moraines and slides and debris can wash off much quicker. Um, the other key point is all the projections are describing warmer climate in the future, more precipitation as rain than snow, and more intense rainfall when it comes. That's going to drive floods to be larger and more frequent. And we have a paper out on this that describes that today's 100-year stream flood on the Skagit is going to become 25% larger by 2040, so not too far away. And also, today's 100-year flood is going to be occurring more like a 20-year event uh, by the 2040 period. Now, what we did is relate all of the work we do on sediments coming down rivers to also calculate what do all these downscale global change models predict for the amount of sediment coming down the systems, especially given there's all that loose sediment to be able to move through the system. And we predicted um, in this paper a couple years ago, potentially three to six times more sediment that flood managers are gonna be needing to deal with by the 2080s. And we already have some of the largest sediment loads in the country and we're going to be challenged, so it's something to consider. Getting down to the coastal side of things, the sea level rise, the coastal storms, the waves, um, these two pictures really say it all. Um, almost all of the sea level rise assessments that you read are talking about the picture on the left. What's going to happen way out in the distance in the future? Um, with sea level rise. When is it going to get to that point in the sand that it starts to really flood us? And that's really important information to plan with. That's when everything's going to change and you're, we're going to be sort of inundated all the time. But along the way, there'll be these storm events and wave events that come at us every couple years, every 10 years, maybe it's every 50 years today. And they cause additional flooding. They also cause erosion. They move sediment around. They damage infrastructure. And as sea level rise comes up, these are going to become much more frequent. It's a very similar uh, result as the previous on the stream flooding. With about a foot of sea level rise, we expect today's 100-year coastal storm event to become more of a 10-year event. And with two feet of sea level rise, It'll become an annual event. Those are big events like we saw this last December in Birch Bay and elsewhere happening regularly. Okay, and this is downtown um, right off of Rotor a couple of years ago. Water got up and over from the bay, filled the parking lot. What we do know about sea level rise is that it's around the world, it's accelerating. It used to be kind of slow on the left and it's definitely now increasing much more rapidly, about three times faster than 100 years ago, everywhere. There's, there are sort of regional differences and there are temporal differences. This plot on the right shows sea level history for the last 100 years from Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego. And you can see that through time, the West Coast sea level, rise, sea level rates also change for periods of 20 to 30 years. We've been in a period of relatively slow sea level rise the last 20 to 30 years, but we now think that we're, we've jumped back into a much more rapid period like what you see in the middle. Um, we're gonna keep our eyes on this and, and test this, but it's looking like the last four or five years, it's actually been increasing much more rapidly. 
And then um, much more recently, the last couple months, uh, Ian Miller and I and several others on a large regional project uh, published this, which is a new, uh, much more spatial re spatially resolved or downscaled estimate of sea level rise here in Washington state. It's the first of its kind for any of our coastal states across the nation at this scale. And we provide a number of different um, scenarios for planners to work with. This is the most likely scenario of uh, anywhere between a foot and two and a half feet of sea level rise. The higher red colors are, um, sorry, higher rates of sea level rise. Uh, and then we also provide a different sort of sense of risk, um, a lower probability, um, but as the last speaker alluded to, he was concerned that this might not be representing the full sort of likelihood. And I would have to agree with him that if we, Look at the science over the last 20 years. We've constantly reevaluated our projections um, to be higher. All of our early model predictions are now showing um, that they're the, essentially, we're, we're following the highest rate of all the past predictions in terms of what's actually happening. And so I think, especially since we even published this last summer, there's new evidence that the ice sheets in the high latitudes are, are starting to melt even faster. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is a um, much higher likelihood than just 1% chance. This could, in fact, turn out to be 10 to 20% chance. And these numbers are five feet of sea level rise in the Seattle area, maybe three to four feet here. Now, when you get to storms and waves, this is really kind of the, the, the part that's not being addressed very well. In most of the planning and most of the actual sea level rise assessments, it's very hard to do, it's hard to predict, it's very complex. This is your Beach Bay, a Birch Bay waterfront um, just this last December 20th. That is an enormous wave for a small estuary like we have. I think most people um, may have seen this before in 1982 and other times, but it's actually very large. It's probably taller than I am. Um, <clears throat> did a lot of damage, it literally uh, pulled apart the seaward lane of the coastal road. And what we do know about storms and waves are that the wave heights throughout the North Pacific are actually increasing the last several decades. The frequency of, storm, of very intense storms are increasing. Atmospheric rivers that um, bring a lot of the change in pressure and winds to our area are also expected to increase in frequency and intensity. Um, it's still a little uncertain how much it may be in the noise, but uh, even today it causes a lot of disruption. And then finally, the last big driver that I wanna talk about is this groundwater. This is looking back at that Skagit River system, um, the Delta, and one of my colleagues at the Water Science Center in Tacoma produce this map. There's blue lines that are the surface elevation of the groundwater below the land in some kind of odd numbers, depth below the well casing, which might be of interest to some of us. And uh, what I did in a minute, I'll show you. Um, but the other part of this is that we asked to, for them to put some wells in to start monitoring whether there's tidal influence below the Skagit farmlands. And that plot down there shows that. There in the red line, uh, a couple tenths of a foot oscillations at the six, 12, 24 hour time frames from tides, two kilometers or so inland from the seawater. And still amplitude such that it probably penetrates even further up into the landscape. Okay, so getting back to that surface elevation of the groundwater, all I did was convert that to be sort of like your boat freeboard What's the depth of the groundwater below the land surface? That's what we care about. And we had brand new elevation data for the land. And that's what this picture shows it. When they measured 30 to 40 wells and went down to that uh, water table, that's how far down the groundwater was. It's, it was. It was above ground in the red colors and within a meter in the bright yellows, a little deeper in the greens and blues. Now, what do you think is going to happen when sea level rise buoys that up another meter, which we're, let's just say three feet of sea level rise by 2100. 
That would shift all of that that was measured in February of 2008 to look like this. And this lasted for about two weeks, that period of time. A lot of the area would be, in fact, ponded above the land surface if those same conditions that were seen in February of 2008 reoccur with three feet of sea level rise. <clears throat> okay, so what kind of models and tools and data can we start to develop to help inform all of this? And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So I want to focus in on the extreme water levels and the flooding. This is um, down near Anacortes a few years ago. We want to predict that. This is a little interactive part for you all. Who can chime in and tell me what physical components contribute to that water level splashing up to the first uh, roof, roof of those homes? Wanna Wind, king tides, atmospheric pressure, savvy group. Water temperature. Water temperature. David. Water depth. Okay. So what I then slope, great. These are the components we are trying to include in a model. Sea level rise, the differences in the tides, the seasonal effects from temperature like El Nino, the blob. Storm surge there on the order of a meter is, we want to use this definition of, of really just the atmospheric pressure influence on the water level. It's what we measure in tide gauges, in what we call stilling wells, and you'll see this in a minute. The dynamic part is up above with the wind piling water up, the waves actually not only elevate the surface when the waves come, but the average position of the water surface also elevates when waves are coming towards the shore. We also have this VLM, vertical land movement, that's uh, built into that sea level um, forecast that I showed you, and then sediment coming out of rivers. And just to show you what we mean about this pressure, this is a typical plot you can get off of any of the NOAA tide gauges, particularly common in the winter where you can see what the predicted tide in blue is and then what's actually measured at a site in the green. And a rule of thumb is that for every millibar of pressure change, or in this case, pressure drop when a storm comes through, the water surface can just automatically rise about a 1.3 to 1.5 centimeters. So imagine our storms come through and they change from 1025 millibars, 1020 millibars, down to 980 or 990. We're talking about 30 to 40, sometimes 50 millibars of change at about 1.5 centimeters is you know, reaching a half a meter to a meter on some of these really extreme events. So our model, this Cosmos model, um, downscales global weather to predict the influence of, of tides and storm surge with pressure and then the winds that drive waves at a regional scale. And we have largely built that for the Puget Sound area. We now have a regional model of the water level and waves that are approaching shore just before they break. The hard part and the expensive part, and the part that we are looking for partners to, to implement across all of Puget Sound is the last part, the local scale. This is where we model up those small transects. I don't know if you can see them very well, but every 100 meters along the shore, how waves break, dissipate their energy, and then rush up the shore uh, to get all the way up onto the highest point. <clears throat> that's the part that uh, takes a lot of physics, a lot of computation time, and um, we are now building out in parts of Puget Sound, and I'll show you a few examples of this. But with that, we can then predict the extent of flooding like you see down on the bottom. We can run all kinds of um, scenarios. We can look at the future in terms of similar storms we observe today with sea level rise or with any projected change in weather. Um, we can look at hindcasts of the past to understand how to maybe describe the historical variability. And we can also do these operational models where we're predicting 48 hours in advance, and we're doing that in a few different embayments, including Bellingham. 
<clears throat> we're trying to make a regional standardized FEMA-like model of the total risk due to sea level rise and climate change. FEMA does the 100-year you know, historical flood. They're not necessarily including the projected changes with climate in the future, nor the full range of physics that evolve with sea level rise and um, storm propagation towards the shore. And it's, uh, you know, we're, we want to do this at a scale re relevant for planning. And it's modeled after what we have implemented in California. Many um, universities and agencies collaborated with us to develop it, and many federal, state, county, city coordinating groups um, helped fund it. And there's a website called Our Coast, Our Future, and I've got that for all of you for later, that where you can go see how, this, how you can interact with it and explore your favorite portion of coast. Um, but this is just an example of what the sea level impact might be in the future with uh, a meter 0.25. But look at the difference if you include the dynamic nature of waves and storm. A much larger area of this particular area of Pacifica just below San Francisco is inundated and impacted. And there's other outputs like how long floods might last given the higher sea level position wave heights across the area. This is San Francisco Bay where we've also have it, and that's kind of an analogy for our Sailor Sea. Currents and the speed of currents that might influence, you know, larva propagation, navigation, commerce, oil spills. And then there's also a socioeconomic component that we've built in to follow wherever we go with this Cosmos workflow where you can then explore impacts uh, for a number of um, economic metrics. This is the model domain, the area that we are modeling in order to achieve the rigor we, we need. It's, it's across that whole area, it's hard to tell, it's the lighter blue color across all of Vancouver Island, the Strait of Georgia. And those dots down there show where we have existing wave information from NOAA. There's only one in US waters. And then six tide gauge, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven tide gauges. Um, to then test how well our model does. We include 24 rivers, of all the flow coming in, including this, um, the Fraser. And then what we've been doing is adding all these other stations to measure water levels and waves in much more detail for this model validation and closer to shore where we really want to know the, the behavior. And this is what it looks like. It's just one example of one area that we can zoom into, Strait of Juan de Fuca, showing the, the big ocean swell coming in on the left and how it moves through towards Whidbey Island. And then those arrows show where the pressure and the winds that are influencing our local area are also creating locally generated uh, wind waves from our southeast storms. And then below is... Um, our model skill, how well we are predicting with the blue line, what we've been measuring in the circles. And it's doing pretty good. Sometimes, overall, we probably underestimate, um, largely because the winds that we are using also often do not represent wind on water as like we need. There's few measurements made on the water. Um, we need more of that kind of information to get it right. This is your um, Zawanich Park down by the marina. Um, just this last December. When the waves hit, that's what we really are interested in, in too. And this is an example of our Bellingham Bay model. Uh, the yellow colors just mean pretty high wave heights of a, uh, three to four, five feet uh, just this last January and December. And our measurements um, at those letters, and this is an example of how well our model is, is doing uh, modeling the waves getting real close to shore and partly breaking. So we're getting closer to the impact zone that we're interested in, and we're doing really well. Again, we underestimate sometimes by a little bit, um, but exciting. And then there's this validation we do for the, the actual flooding on land, and the blue shading across the map down by Swinomish Reservation shows what we predicted for a big storm in 2006. And the black line shows where the water line was at 7 a.m. that day when I went down there and surveyed it, uh, crossing the road and leaving a big debris line. And um, you could say that's 
um, model predicted the flooding pretty well. We also see it on Lummi Shore Drive very frequently. So then, how can we use this information? Uh, how can the models be used, and who is using the information? So first and foremost, you know, we have not built it out yet for Puget Sound, so we don't have a lot of success stories yet. Uh, but California has implemented the whole workflow. They are now Caltrans, for example, and counties are using the information. Um, and this came out just a couple weeks ago. You may have seen it in the news, but California is up in arms at some of the projections for the loss of beaches and bluffs and cliffs that are projected in the next 30 to 50 years. And it's going to be a big economic hit to tourist economy. Those bands of color show, for example, a projection of how far the bluffs are going to retreat at a particular time. Um, and so the plot down below shows how far the bluffs are likely to erode back and the probability at different decades in the future for planners to work with. And they're um, pretty excited to at least have these tools. Now the hard part is how to really think about policy to deal with it. Here more locally, we have some very interesting success stories working in this case with Swinomish tribe, looking at how beaches and shellfish habitats and um, fishery practices are going to be playing out with sea level rise. And there's some really just unique features of our complex, beautiful beaches that are sometimes steep, sometimes narrow. Um, when we model the sea level rise, all that area in red uh, becomes kind of the um, last remaining accessible shellfish habitat. And the yellow part uh, looks like it's going to be lost and much harder to access given this increase in water level. And more so in front of those blue lines of seawalls. Um, so we were able to address this in a couple papers. And there's a website called the toolkit.climate.gov, which is fabulous for th learning about adaptation. Um, but there's going to be some complex changes there due to waves that we didn't address and that we are now that will affect whether shellfish will even want to grow there, whether crab will want to recruit on those beaches, uh, whether forage fish are going to want to spawn there, and how lagoons, like that beautiful little lagoon there, may shift and migrate and change with all these changing physics. What's really interesting is there hasn't been any quantitative model for uh, the Salish Sea uh, to, to characterize the wave climate, even though <laughs> we take a lot of risk uh, ferrying through it and, um, as you know, sometimes seeing waves this large. So we do now have a bona fide regional model of the entire area. And in fact, a hindcast of the last 60 years uh, and we can pull out of this model at any location and at any moment in time all kinds of metrics like the water level, the wave heights, the periods, the energy, the shear stress at the bottom that's eroding things. Um, we can also sum those metrics up over different periods of time. And in this case, we did that and found the annual maximum wave height to just show people along the shoreline what what we should be expecting for planning and that what have you. But the real kind of benefit of this is now what we can do with this. And that's what I want to show you is we can relate this hindcast now to some changes that we've been observing on the landscape. This is Port Susan Bay in the foreground, Skagit Bay in the background. The farmers living right there uh, where the text says first observed overwash 2006 were very surprised that day. They've never seen the coast come up and over their levees. Why? Well, they also noticed that offshore, it seemingly, seemingly they lost a lot of marsh. And in fact, they hypothesized maybe up to a kilometer. And did that marsh used to protect them from storm surge? Well, we did the analysis and found, sure enough, there's been um, a change in the marsh extent uh, about a kilometer in that area and erosion going on the last 40, 50 years, tremendous amounts of erosion. Is this related to wave energy? Well, we tried to tackle this. We, we are tackling that there in Port Susan, and we're tackling it in that next bay north at Skagit. This is an example of stranded marsh sitting offshore. You can see this in a number of places, including the Nooksack now. We're starting to see this. <clears throat> 
out on the tide flats with sandy, rippled sands uh, in between the shoreline about 300 to 500 meters to the right. Um, and so what we did is we examined that annual wave climate over that period of time. And that's just a nice picture here to show you what that looks like. It's, um, but the real story here are these, this colored map that Greg Hood and I published showing how the extent of marshes have changed since the 1930s. And what we saw in these plots on the right are that the North, um, Middle, and South Fork marshes have all be, been decreasing in their uh, annual growth rate. So the amount of area that they were adding each year has been re reducing to the point where the South Fork and the Bayfront have actually gone below zero. So they're erosional, despite that enormous sediment load I told you about. So we're thinking, well, there's plenty of sediment. These marshes should be fine. But in fact, some are showing erosion. And the North Fork happens to be a little luckier. And I'll show you why in a second. And so what we did is we summed up that wave energy from our model, hindcast over those 60 years, over those periods of time that we reconstructed the marsh area. And sure enough, the wave energy on the bottom correlates very well, modestly well, let's say, with those progradation rates to explain a big part of the loss of those marshes. We didn't expect it to explain everything because there's other factors like sediment delivery to the system, new seed production. Sometimes there's really episodic grazing by geese that just eliminate a huge area at once. So we do think sea level rise of about five to seven inches in the last you know, few decades, along with the added energy that I told you about, has been influencing these marshes. Now, um, down in Tacoma, we have another success story where we did do that modeling every 100 meters along this new Ruston Way development site they have. I'm not sure why that particular location. Um, the colors are a little tricky, but um, what this is is the current 50-year event that a lot of planners use. Uh, you can barely make out a black line, which is the FEMA 100-year base flood elevation. And all we did was project this on with sea level rise to see what would today's 50 year storm event look like with additional sea level by 2100. And we used 2.8 feet of sea level rise, which is that most likely number from our assessment. And sure enough, the 50 year storm event then um, extends and exceeds today's 100 year base flood by a fair amount. And we can paint how deep the water will be over parks, restoration sites, development sites, what have you. But coming back now to Birch Bay and learning a little bit, how do we put these events that we've been seeing in the context of the past variability and what to expect in the future? Can anyone here tell me what the December 2018 flood event in Birch Bay was in terms of a 100-year event, a 50-year event, or a 25, does anyone want to? Hazard, I guess. You'd be safe to say anything close to 50 to 100. It's definitely up there. Um, but this part of the talk is going to be an engaging one. I'm going to teach you all to be oceanographers. So this is zooming in on our Whatcom Coast. This is the deep water waves coming to our shore. And what can we learn from the regional model before we get the uh, support to model the real physics running up the beach? The only thing we can draw on really is these observations and then the fact that we have a cherry point tide gauge right nearby. So this plot here shows the predicted tides for this 2018 event on, in the blue and 1982, supposedly the largest event, the highest event um, in the black. And what matters though is not the tide predictions as I showed you, but all these other factors, the pressure, the winds, what have you. And here's what was measured at Cherry Point in the blue and the black. So in fact, 1982, Cherry Point measured a higher water level than 2018. But this doesn't tell the whole story. What's really more important is the difference between measured and predicted. So this next plot is that. The red color, OK, black and blue are, are just the difference between measured and predicted for the 2018 and 1982. The red is the difference for this last big storm when we've had measurements of pressure. 
The pressure can explain about half of the whole anomaly, close to two and a half, two and a half, three feet. Um, the other portion is the winds and waves. The wind piled it up, the water up, the waves also helped set up the water level and created you know, a much higher water level. So if we really want to evaluate risk around us, we need to be able to assess these dynamic conditions. Now most certainly the water level at Birch Bay was higher than at Cherry Point and that's what this Cosmos model wants to help resolve and help us resolve when we should expect that, uh, how often we should expect it. Uh, that will be a planning tool for everyone. Using Cherry Point is an underestimate and um, only part of the risk. But even more importantly, it wasn't the highest big storm event and anomaly. The 1982 was much, was a bit larger. The lucky thing was it aligned with a tide of about five feet instead of a real high tide. Super lucky that this 1982 event wasn't at high tide or else it really would have just um, had a much larger impact. And that's what I want to get to is how do we start factoring in and modeling the, the co-occurrence, the joint occurrence of a big 100-year stream flood event as well as a big coastal flood event at the same time. We're lucky we haven't experienced it. We kind of have an example from 2006, the Hanukkah day storm. The colors on the left show the water level influence from pressure at Birch Bay in that gold color, which is about 0 0.45, 0 0.5 meters or so. And our modeling with this cosmos was able to look at the storm and um, deconvolve that the wind contributed somewhere on the order of a quarter meter or so. So that's you know getting close to a foot for that uh, 2006 storm. The wind speeds of this last December 18 storm were tremendous. We've never seen sustained winds so high. Much, it was like several uh, meters per second higher than the um, 2006 storm. So the winds probably played a bigger role in 2018 than this map shows. And that's what we want to really get at. What's the total risk? This is just down at Rotor Avenue, December 20th last winter. And if any of you were around in 2016, you also saw this, but it was maybe half that depth. Cars were literally uh, going through two and a half feet of water. The tides on December 20th, this last December, were lower than March of 2016. The pressure uh, didn't have as much influence. The winds and waves made up the difference and elevated the water here in Bellingham Bay higher than the past couple big, big, big storms. It's really interesting. And what's really important is then being able to assess how uh, different thresholds that we care about and uh, recurrence frequencies of extreme events that we care about, the smaller ones, the 10-year events, the 20-year events, they're gonna start playing much more of an important role in our impacts than just the 100-year sea level position. And that's what this shows, these thresholds that uh, we care about in Bellingham for flooding, for stormwater, for all kinds of things, starts to increase incredible um, exponentially. The time of occurrence, this is in days of exceedance per year, uh, with two feet of sea level, this is 2060, 2070, we're gonna be having days and days of events that now tax us and emergency management and all kinds of things. And then the big events uh, will be kind of really happening a, a day or two. And if everything aligns, the big 100-year stream flow and the 100-year coastal flood event, this is what we published and predicted for the Skagit. That's an enormous event that we fortunately have not observed yet, um, but we want to be able to get there. I've got about three or four slides left to put our mindset into now, what are our opportunities and what is out there for a community like ours to draw on and think about moving forward? So typical adaptation strategies um, tend to look like on the left. Let's characterize those threats and impacts like we've talked about today and the couple sessions before me. Then we get into the nitty gritty of what's the real vulnerability to those uh, threats and impacts. 
We develop a vision and guiding principles, maybe prioritize certain strategies, and then try to implement, learn, and adaptively manage. And so, for example, on the right, you've got this, our FEMA sort of imp impact assessment for a 100-year flood across our system, valued at about $18 billion. I would add, we have a lot to learn from our First Nations and tribal uh, collaborators and community members around us. They're advancing the idea of ad adaptation in ways that we could learn a lot from in terms of understanding what's, what really impacts our community health, our, our well-being beyond just maybe an individual economic impact or an infrastructure impact. Then I think it's really important for a group to think about the disturbance tolerance that we have. Disregard anything I t told you today, but how long could you live without your favorite hospital or your favorite store or a school or a jail if, for example, something happened and there's no food or all the inmates get out? What are you able to live with and for how long? How would you then also think about the recovery capacity for something like that? And then you could cross cut that with everything we've been talking about today. We have a lot at stake, I won't go into this. Um, the main point about this is we're not alone. Whatever happens in our county, we're also just intimately connected to our neighboring counties. We need to be thinking about this as a region. Uh, we have a lot invested in um, some really sort of key issues along the shore uh, with the cleanups that we want to be concerned with with coastal change. This is all on the back of your flyer. Um, I didn't talk at all about sort of the, the droughts and the heat coming, but um, that's a subject that we can and it actually influences a lot of what I told you about. But there's last slide, strategies. Most of us have sort of been aware of these things in the past. We either resist it and build taller walls, or we can adapt and maybe even transform, which is sort of the ultimate. Uh, there's a lot of components like thinking more about modifying our practices and planning for these projections and thinking about longer time horizons than we typically do. A 50-year sort of design window is nothing like seven generations. Um, expand sort of other standards for impacts. Think about diversity and how buffers can uh, help our resilience. We can build ecosystems that help buffer and that are much more resilient and that we then gain food from uh, more comfortably. A lot of restoration of habitats. Um, but what you're doing today is key. Improving community awareness and understanding the full set of trade-offs to then incorporate into some decision making. Um, there's a lot of criteria that are hugely important. Uh, obviously, you have to be able to afford it. It's got to be feasible, and we can come back to that. Um, but these are the key things to, to recall from um, what is being learned about adaptation. Even if we could curb our, emission, get our emissions today, so many climate impacts are already uh, you know, in motion, have momentum, and they're going to continue for decades. There's large consequences of not acting now, um, but these innovative approaches provide all kinds of research and development and economic opportunities. Um, it's obviously more proactive to plan and it's much more efficient. Um, opportunities where we can invest both in ecosystems and hazards reduction. And I think I'll end that. And these are just the summaries of the entire talk. I hope you come out of here realizing flooding and storm impacts are going to be increasing. The groundwater elevations are increasing and to pond on top of our landscape. These complex interactions are unique to the Northwest and probably are important for us to develop more unique strategies. Uh, and there's some tools out here that um, are there for you guys to use. So I'll leave it at that for more information. Eric, thanks so much. Some pretty dramatic uh, visuals to accompany all of the uh, metric calculations that we had to do during your talk. But uh, are there any questions from members, members of the uh, members city club? Not yet. Not yet. Hello. Go ahead. 
Uh, so I have a question related to the uh, increased level of seawater or salt water under the groundwater in the farmlands. Will that ponding result in a salinification of the land, a reduction of agricultural capacity? Indeed it will. It's a little farther off in the distance. There are some cases in the Skagit of salt water flowing up like an artesian well periodically already. So it's, it is happening in some locations. Um, that's another sort of case for groundwater management to allow enough to keep that head and keep it offshore as long as we can, but yep. I wonder if you could uh, comment on an article in the last issue of Scientific American by Richard Alley. I don't know if you had a chance to see that. He teaches at University of Pennsylvania, spent 40 years working on Greenland. It's on the Antarctic, though. And he talks about the potential of, because of what's happening in the Edmondson Abatement, of 11 feet of sea level rise happening over decades instead of centuries. Have you seen the article? Absolutely. Okay. I know Richard Alley personally. My career that I, w I had before this was scuba diving underwater, coring coral reefs, looking at the history of sea level. Geologists like me know that during the last period of time when we had a climate like this, it's called the last interglacial period 125,000 years ago. It sounds like a long time, but it's not. It was the last time that we had climate stable like we live in. During the glacials, it's much more unstable and dynamic. And the last period of that interglacial, we all believe from records of corals and uplifted terraces and all kinds of uh, data now, sea level jumped at least two to three meters, so six to seven, eight, nine feet, maybe even higher for an extended sort of several hundred years, maybe a couple thousand years at the end of that warm period. And what are we doing right now? We're warming at a rate much higher than any rate that was um, observed back in that last interglacial. So, in our North County area, um, are are there is there a there's a relationship between the Fraser and the Nooksack geologically, prehistorically, or whatever? And are there uh, is there a sister organization working to study the impacts of the Fraser? and the likely impact on our North County from changes that are happening to that huge, huge watershed going up into British Columbia? I'll answer that there's the Fraser Basin Council. It's a wonderful um, organization and they have a nice web presence, maybe better than ours. Um, but there's a lot to learn of what they have been evaluating um, in terms of hazards and potential climate impacts. Um, they are looking at how they um, project changes in the Fraser system. Whether or not they're looking at any impacts back over to our side, I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar with yet. Hi there. I was hoping you could speak to some of the ecosystem strategies that we could use in our toolbox to reduce uh, hazard risk. So one of the things that we looked at for the Port Susan Bay area was if we could restore this big marsh that's stood a kilometer offshore and about a meter taller than, than the present tide flat, it could help buffer these storm events, these big storm surge and wave events, um, bringing down the overall water level about a half a meter. So that would be fantastic to bring back a lot more of this so-called green infrastructure. It's, it's actually been proven to work in other parts of the world. The Dutch uh, do it. Um, there's also ideas of reefs offshore that would help buffer some of these impacts, uh, clam gardens. And um, the argument against that is that it modifies the seafloor when we do s put in a reef offshore. But in fact, all that landscape modification that I told you about at the beginning where we've essentially focused so much fine sediment offshore has done a, a bigger disservice to, to the habitats. So I think there's an argument where we could start to put in some of these adaptation strategies and actually help recover rocky habitat, more diverse habitat, and some of these ecosystem services. So, um, You didn't mention uh, railroad tracks, and, and Whatcom County particularly has one of the places where the railroads get along the shoreline and they have a lot of bulkheads that they've built up, and I'm sure that impacts the, the soil, the, the whole runoff stuff, but also the impact of, of all this on the railroad tracks because it's a huge, you know, a lot of things move on those tracks. So. 
we've asked to um, have some discussions, and I have yet to get any, I don't know, <laughs> response or interest in what we're doing, despite they could really benefit. Um, but they've got, you know, enormous um, resources. In December of this 20, just, just south of Fairhaven, a, a large area of that seawall just got eroded right up to the wall, to the rail. But they were able to respond the next day and just solve that quickly. What I wonder about is for every unit that you go up, whether it's a rail or a levee or a dike or what have you, you need to go out about 20 times to structurally fortify that. Maybe there'll be better techniques for some things. Um, but that ends up uh, being a large footprint on everything else we care about, whether it's farmland or near shore habitats. So I'm not quite sure what, what the long-term solution is for BNSF and others, but um, we'd love to sort of be able to help work with them and um, think about timelines that certain thresholds will be met, at least to help plan for some investment and, um, yeah. Back to adaptation techniques and, and environmental strategies. Um, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, I believe, is looking at removing the, um, the dike from the east side of the Nooksack down by Marietta, and I'm guessing that that would be beneficial for the Nooksack River and for the Delta habitat over time. I'm not sure I'm ready to comment exactly on that. Um, there's a number of different possible alternatives. Many are pulling that back and allowing the river to connect back to the floodplain through different channels and maybe reduce some of the, fl the water levels in the main stem of the river, you know, deliver f water, fish, sediment, nutrients to areas that used to, to receive it. Um, but there are, there's a, a number of really potentially great strategies in our watershed. I think, other people will know, but I think the acreage is uh, larger than some of the other watersheds south of us. So I think we have a really intact system and potential for a lot of great uh, restoration. Uh, I uh, am about to try and organize a mapping for our, our neighborhood for emergency. And I wondered uh, if what you think I should say about your talk for my introduction to uh, emergency preparedness in the neighborhood of Fairhaven area. So I did, uh, I did um, state that we have this operational capacity and we'd like to expand that. Uh, we, can, we can do it really well out 48 hours. At that point, Cliff Mass and everyone else will tell you that the weather predictions don't serve us well enough. Um, but there are some things we can do about five days out in advance. And um, if that is an interest, um, I think it would behoove our community to get together and you know, tell your elected officials and others that you want this capacity and we'll try to build it and get that going. Um, we do sort of run it for Bellingham Bay, and when there's a big event, I tend to alert a few key people. Uh, you mentioned in the previous comment the, uh, the Nooksack River and its basins and so forth. I learned many years ago when I came here that the Nooksack runs along a hillside in its main stem between where it comes out of the mountains and before it gets down to the flatlands. And occasionally, there's been two or three times that the river has jumped out of its area and flowed all the way up to Canada through the Sumas River Basin. What is the hazard of that and the thing, and is there any work that could be done to prevent that from happening again? <laughs> We're currently undergoing a, a big project that David's part of that's gonna explore all these potential future sort of hydrologic changes that I described, as well as some of the sea level parts and how the community up in our watershed sort of want to um, strategize for those. Um, so we don't have the answer, but we're gonna listen to the community, kind of what, the, what they value, and we do have ideas about how to manage sediment better, how to manage flows better, allow the river to meander and do some of what it's supposed to do, um, but it's gonna take some trade-offs from um, what we all are sort of used to doing. Eric, I have a question for you. Uh, 
you've got a room full of people here, and I, I know everyone cares a whole bunch, but it's also hard to imagine how can we individually help really move some things along. Would you please, you're working both with the Skagit and uh, Whatcom uh, climate change groups. Would you give us some, some suggestions about how we can best get that rolling and what we can do with our elected officials to, to um the ante a little bit? That's, that's my thought, we need to do that. Um, you, I'm kind of talk, speaking to the choir here, you're all sort of the most active in our community, um, but you can get more active. <laughs> and um, we do have this new budding Whatcom County Climate Advisory Council. I've seen a few faces in this room that have come. Um, it's open to the public. It's a forum for engaging people interested and then learning and taking that message to your elected officials. Um, there, there's a lot more science out um, that's, that's testing the ability for habitat restoration to reduce our flood reduction, our, our, our flood risk. And many of our elected officials are not entertaining that and they're not allowing natural processes funding processes, um, momentum that's statewide to be, to be implemented here in our county. Um, there's a fantastic program. It's called Floodplains by Design, and there's other versions of it uh, in individual counties. But it is a program that's trying to invest in each of our, our counties to learn what to do, try some of these green infrastructure approaches out, help benefit both the habitats, salmon, ecosystem restoration, alongside reducing hazards for farmers and our, our people in our county and our, the, our constituents. Um, that's a really big one, and we didn't speak up loud enough a few years ago, and we somehow allowed that money to go somewhere else. I think that does a disservice to our own constituents and our people in our system. We need to know about that, and none of you know, maybe enough of us didn't know about it, and we chose to um, let that go somewhere else. But there's other programs. There's um, we have a very active, sort of diverse group here in our watershed, and I think we're learning from some of the earliest farmers that here and the Skagit and other places that. You know, they also share the same ideal. They want to have open space. They want to let the river do its thing. They were kind of disappointed that their grandfather put the levee where they did. It's harder now to move it back, but there are opportunities, and there's a seemingly, maybe I'm a little too optimistic, but there's a, I don't know, I think this is a good question for Dave, too. He's been part of this. There's a growing public will to try to start entertaining some really novel things for us demonstrated already in the Netherlands and other places. Um, so it's up to us to sort of express our concern and interest in it. So.